Before the drugs came into wide use in the mid-50s, electric shock treatment was a common procedure. In it is used less frequently now, but still more than 100,000 people are shocked every year. This woman is about to get a series of treatments. She is in her early 30s, married, the mother of two children, and she's depressed. Her psychiatrist is Dr. Paul Blatchley of the University of Oregon. All right, ready? Here we go. You're producing an electrical disturbance of the brain, a gross disorganization of the uh, usual patterns, and uh, uh, presumably the abnormality that, uh, for which we're treating the patient is an electrical dysfunction, and for some reason we don't understand when the patient recovers from the treatment, they seem to be in a better state of mind. Can I do another one, Paul? I think so. She's, these are short seizures. Unlike most other psychiatrists, Dr. Blatchley gives his patients several treatments in a short period of time. In this instance, the woman will get four shocks in about 20 minutes. Usually, they're spaced out over a period of days or weeks. Like all other psychiatric treatments, no one is quite sure how electric shock works. There are at least 50 theories, but no hard facts. The patient is heavily sedated. A second drug relaxes her muscles so completely she must be given oxygen to keep her breathing. Until about 20 years ago, the shock was administered while the patient was still awake, and convulsions were so severe, many patients broke bones while thrashing around. Here we go. With this new procedure, you can generally see the convulsion only in the toes. Okay. This patient convulsed more than usual. Her whole body shook. Okay, now what you should notice is that although the muscle activity has stopped, the electrical index of seizure activity continues. Here's the end of the seizure over here, see? And uh, the muscular activity is not a good indication of the seizure itself. All right. We're ready to go. More people get more angry about electric shock than any other psychiatric procedure. Well, I think that's uh, absolutely barbaric and, and a gross misuse of electricity, to, to say nothing of the poor people whose brains get fried. I mean, uh, the way in which the brain normally actions, you, you, you deal with millivolts or thousands of a volt. Uh, ECT consists of hundreds of volts uh, passed through someone's brain and just like it's true that you can chemically control someone, yes, you can electrically shock someone uh, out of their so-called crazy mind, but you don't shock them back into their right mind, you shock them into a shocked mind. At the, at the termination of a course of ECT, under the best of circumstances, you are left with an acute insult to brain, leaving an individual uh, confused, disoriented, without judgment, in which his emotional level uh, may be quite uh, disorganized, in which uh, virtually impossible to obtain any intelligible responses on any kind of testing, and in which uh, if one measures the electrical activity of brain that time, there isn't any question that there's been an injury. That, <clears throat> that is an allegation without uh, foundation in clinical practice, I think. The, uh, we certainly see no evidence of that. And uh, since we've never had a death, there's, there's no way of uh, evaluating that in uh, our patients, but uh, perhaps someday there will be. Um, in animals, uh, we've not seen any evidence that when the animal is well ventilated, and uh, completely paralyzed. And when you do a uh, treatment in the way that is analogous to the way we treat patients, that there's any damage whatsoever. If you look at the studies in which they claim there's no brain damage, you find the most bizarre findings, such as footnotes about one animal who was discovered to be bleeding in his brain, but they decided, the electroshockers who did the study, that this was irrelevant. If you take the four or five major animal studies that are allegedly prove no brain damage, you actually find damage in them. It's a most amazing fact if you actually look up the studies. I think that it is a treatment that uh, is useful, can be beneficial, but that should come after certain other reasonable alternatives have been tried because it, it has a certain hazard to it.
but quite aside from the hazard in the sense of the actual physical hazard, I think that uh, there, the individual certainly can experience it as something that is sort of forced on him or done to him. It can be felt as a kind of an attack, and I think it is far better that uh, uh, a person's treatment be carried on without them having to have gone through that experience, if you can possibly do it. The most consistent complaint about electric shock is the loss of memory that follows. Ellen Niemer can't even remember getting shocked 17 times several years ago, but her medical records confirm it. She is aware, however, of what it's been like for her ever since. Um, I couldn't remember how to get to West Lynn. Now, that's very wrong. I lived there for two and a half years. I didn't even know where that was. I, I didn't know that Martin Luther, Martin Luther King was dead. I didn't know that John F. Kennedy had been assassinated. Those are just small little everyday, you know, things that, that I had to deal with. Finding out, and then you ask people, you know, well, what happened to Martin Luther King? Because you don't know. And they look at you like, my God, where have you been? Then you try to explain to them that you've had shock treatment, and you don't know. Then they look at you like you're a total reject. Marilyn Rice was a highly paid government economist who had been given eight shock treatments in a private hospital because of a depression. Several weeks later, she went back to work. I went back to work at the beginning of July. In that intervening time, I had come home and I was leading a very easy, groggy life here. And in looking back, it's very strange that I wasn't reading or studying as one would do when one's convalescing from anything. So I wasn't really aware of the extent of my memory loss. I just thought it was funny that I didn't know where things were around the house and uh, the little things, they seem more amusing. But when I went back to work, I, you just can't believe it. I felt that I, well, I felt alive. I could think. Um, I felt, but when I reached back in my memory, there wasn't anything there. Our patients have uh, very little memory loss. And uh, for some, it's completely undetectable, even within a day of treatment. And uh, I suspect that uh, is due to the fact that uh, they are very well oxygenated during the entire procedure, plus the fact that uh, we are using uh, apparatus now that uh, delivers far less uh, electrical energy to produce the result than what was available before. There are a number of cases in which uh, irreversible changes in memory or uh, other unfortunate uh, changes in the neurologic uh, picture have occurred. I think they're uncommon at, at serious level, but uh, perhaps two-thirds of patients six months to a year after ECT will complain of frequent memory complaints. They may be trivial, but that there's something different. While the doctors argue, Ellen Niemer is trying to put her life back together again, filling in the bits and pieces she says are missing because of the electric shock treatments. For a while, she went to a real estate school, but still hasn't decided what she wants to do. Marilyn Rice spends most of her time at home now. After several months back on the job, she was given a disability pension from the government because she just couldn't remember all the things she once knew about our economy. She sued her doctor and the hospital for $1 million, but lost the case. The patient is a young man in his 30s, a college graduate from the Midwest. He's been through psychotherapy, chemotherapy, and electric shock treatments, and none of them worked. This is the ultimate treatment, psychosurgery an operation on the brain, though there is no organic disease in his brain, to try and modify his behavior. This goes out there. He will remain awake during the four-hour procedure. The surgeon is Dr. William B. Scoville. He was a complex case of one-half schizophrenia and one-half emotions. In other words, he had 
phobias and fears and depression. He was thoughts of suicide and anxiety. And although he was a graduated summa cum laude, he ended up unable to hold any job simply because he was distracted by his own fears. He also had a little perversion of thought processes. So we called him what we call a pseudo-neurotic schizophrenia. And it was, a, it was both emotions and thoughts that were a little bit sick. Dr. Scoville calls this operation orbital undercutting one of several new sophisticated techniques used in psychosurgery. 30 years ago, it was known as a frontal lobotomy. One technique then was to take a medical instrument shaped like an ice pick, insert it through the top of the patient's eye socket, and swish it back and forth, severing a portion of the frontal lobes from the rest of the brain. As many as 40,000 lobotomies were performed then, and many patients were left permanently impaired. In the past, we did more damage than we do now. But the point I want to make is that the damage done by the illness is so much more disabling than the damage the present day operations do that uh, I feel it's, it's worth, worth the candle. But the question remains, how much do we actually know about the brain? And particularly, how much do we know about the brain's role in controlling emotion and behavior? This is where the greatest advances are now being made in brain function and physiology. It's only in the last 25 years that we have been able to pinpoint a certain number of these. We're now, we've made enormous advances over what was known 25 years ago. From my reading and my experience uh, working with brain and research and so forth, uh, I'm not at all satisfied that we understand enough or understand the consequences long term of uh, irreversible alterations of even small parts of brain. If we don't know that much about the brain, how can anyone operate on it for psychiatric reasons? Is it a reasonable surgical procedure? Or is it an experiment? Certain people say it's experimental, but I don't think any psychosurgeon say it's experimental. It's been in existence over a generation. It came out in 1933 or 34, and uh, this is now 77. And it's been tried, and a great deal of physiologic studies have been made, of chemical studies. It's been studied more exactly than most uh, surgical operations have. So I don't call it experimental. Psychosurgery, is that a reasonable practice? No. Even for the most serious of illnesses? No. Even after everything else has been tried? Well, when you say practice, I get the feeling you mean is it a reasonable therapy? Yes, that's right. No, but it's not a therapy. That's the first thing that needs to be said is it's an experimental procedure. Now, if we recognize that it's experimental, then we would we would have to ask all your questions over again and say, is, is it a reasonable experiment? Is all right, it, is, is it a reasonable experiment? Uh, I would say it hasn't been conducted reasonably so far, and I don't see any signs that it's going to be. And what I mean by that is a reasonable, and I'm using the term reasonable to mean ethical, legal, and above board, uh, would Im that would imply, first of all and foremost, that the subject of the experiment is told that he's being experimented upon. And that isn't done. See, now this is gray matter and white matter. This is white matter here, and that's gray matter there. This right. is the crucial and part of the operation, the actual cutting of the brain. That's outside the brain. Now I'm headed to the same spot inside the brain. All right, now this is to show. This is the bone. This is the brain. Now I want to show you inside the brain. Dr. Scoville is now using a microscope to guide him. The image that's is fed to a television monitor in the operating room. That's undercutting. This is white matter. Since nerves cannot heal themselves, the procedure is permanent and irreversible. There is no repairing it. For better or for worse, the patient is a changed person. The fundamental issue of altering 
brain to change behavior, uh, and therefore your being or your personality, in however small amount, even if for uh, a good purpose, for changing some behavior that's gotten you into trouble, uh, you are invading uh, that uh, private space which we all have as individuals, which we're unique. No questions in my mind about that one. They feel that the brain represents the soul and therefore represents the total personality and any operation on the brain that would alter the person's thoughts or emotions must, must almost be like suicide to that person. And so it's, it's a mystic thing and it's almost a religious thought that they feel that God made them personality A and how can a surgeon be so presumptuous as to convert him to personality B? And I understand that, I sympathize with it, but they don't realize that they haven't seen how sick that person was. Finally, it's over. Since the patient was under a local anesthetic, he was able to sit up as soon as it ended. And how different do you feel? Do you feel better, worse, or just the same? Right now, I have a little headache right now. You've got a little headache. Yeah. That over, was last winter. The patient is now back home, and he says he doesn't feel any differently. His parents and his psychiatrist, however, feel he has improved somewhat. Dr. Scoville says it will take up to a year to determine if the operation did any lasting good. Get up this afternoon, if you have to, to go to the toilet, etc. And I think you'll be pleased. And I hope I will be. All right, sir. The final word on psychosurgery will come from Joseph Califano, the Secretary of Health, Education, and Welfare. In 1974, at the urging of Congress, a commission was established to determine, among other things, whether psychosurgery should be continued in this country. Secretary Califano now has the commission's final recommendations. The commission recommended that psychosurgery be permitted under very careful guidelines with a hospital review board to consider every case and with the informed consent of every patient. In its earlier drafts, the commission regarded psychosurgery as an experimental procedure. It now says only that its safety and efficacy have not been sufficiently proved. The fight against psychiatry as it is practiced today is led by a growing number of organizations made up of former mental patients. One of these groups, based in San Francisco, publishes this newspaper. It is called the Network Against Psychiatric Assault. It's just inconceivable to me the amount of power psychiatrists have gathered, and it's really a kind of mystic mystifying power that they have accumulated in gulling the people, in gulling the people to accept these monstrous treatments that do nothing but destroy brain tissue and dehumanize people and make them dependent and helpless instead of really benefiting them, and instead of just allowing them to be themselves, they come in and impose these treatments and force them into a conformist pattern of conduct and thought, which the individual doesn't choose for himself. It's this aspect of, of their forcing themselves on the personalities of individuals that is especially ugly and grotesque. What we really do in the society is that we lock up people who act in ways that we don't understand and that make us feel uncomfortable. But to salve our own conscious consciences, we say, well, you're not a criminal, you know, you're just some poor, unfortunate uh, schizophrenic. And so we're going to put you over here in this hospital where the doctors and the nurses are going to take care of you and uh, make you well again. You know, if you call a place a hospital, everybody knows what a hospital is. A hospital is where you go to get helped. <clears throat> if you call it a prison, everybody knows what that is. Well, we know it's a prison. A prison is a place where you can't get out of, what you, what, that you can't get out of when you want to get out of, except in the case of mental hospitals, they're prisons for people who haven't broken any law. In Boston, a similar group, the Mental Patients Liberation Front. When I got out of the hospital the last time, I was a totally demoralized person. I believed, and I'd been told, I was told in so many words by, by, by a psychiatrist. He said to me, you're never going to be able to survive outside an institution. Your, uh, your, your personality, your uh, defective personality. And I 
I believed it because you know, I, he was a psychiatrist, and, and I, I was, you know, I was this, this, this thing. And it took me a couple of years to get any kind of confidence at all. I mean, I, I, never, t I never would tell anybody in those days that I was an ex-patient. I felt very bad about myself. I was sh just sort of waiting for this inevitable breakdown, which I'd been assured was going to happen, because I'd been told I was never going to survive outside an institution. And what really started changing me was getting into mental patient liberation, which happened about five years ago. And the strength that I have now comes from realizing that all those things that I thought of as my craziness and my uh, delusions were true, that the hospital had damaged me, that psychiatrists had damaged me, that drugs had damaged me, and the strength has come from fighting back. There are many people who can't fight back. Bob Sparkman is one of them. He has been in 13 different mental institutions in the last 16 years. He lives in a small, dingy room in a rundown rooming house in New York's west side. He often stays up most of the night listening to the radio and reading his Bible. He sleeps most of the day. Late in the afternoon on most days, Bob Sparkman goes to the bridge, a drop-in center for former mental patients. The bridge tries to ease the transition from the mental hospital to the outside world by teaching, and sometimes reteaching basic survival skills. It's also a social center. The bridge is very important because I'd, I'd have to stay in my room all the time if the bridge wasn't here, or I'd have to walk the streets. But I come to the bridge, I have coffee, cigarettes, and fellowship. I shared the bridge with some of the people I, I've met here. But the bridge is not enough. What I need is love. I need love, man. Not love, you know, kind of, I have a friend, I have a boy, friend who has a girlfriend, that kind of love. I'm not talking about that kind of love. I need concern, person who's concerned with me. I'm looking for someone else just to need as much as I am so we can share together and fool everybody. Bob Sparkman is still on medication. It's the only aftercare he gets. Well, I went to the clinic on 57th Street, the Kirby Clinic, and I gave him medication. They asked me how I am. Even if they, they ask me how I am, but they're not interested in my answer. What makes you think that? It's true. It's part of, it's part of the communication. How are you? And, I, and they're doing something else as I'm answering them. <laughs> How many of your patients, when they leave here, are simply under control to an extent? And how many of them have learned how to deal with the problem that brought them here in the first place? Good question. I would say that 75% plus are under control. Okay. And I would say that probably less than 50%, maybe even less than 25%, truly understand and have gained, say, a cure from their illness. So it's reasonable that a large portion of that 75% can and will lose control again outside and have to come back in. That does seem to be the pattern. I wouldn't, I wouldn't want to say that as many as 75% come back here. A, a, a lot of people do come back in, and, and I think that's one of the real pitfalls and tragedies of our mental health system. There is no, let me put it this way, there's some, but the follow-up, the aftercare, the treatment outside this place is where things fall apart. Patients many times do kind of get it together, at least well enough to leave this place, even without an understanding of it, but well enough to go back into society. And then something happens out there and there's no follow-up, or the patient doesn't go, or the somebody didn't care, or the appointments are broken, and the patients become ill again. And that, to me, is the real tragedy of our mental health system. Ellen, how many former mental patients are you in contact with, and how are they getting along? About um, 50 of them closely and I don't know how many throughout the state. Uh, how are they getting along? Um, fine, as long as society lets them. Um, and they don't have good jobs. They don't have, uh, you know, like Sally, she's a college graduate. She's got her master's in teaching. She can't get a teaching job in this state. She's never heard of flea. You know, she's been sick. There's a lot of your most talented people that are, um, have mental problems that should be hired and respected with company benefits. These are the people I resent that don't hire them. These are the people that turn them right around, right back into the hospitals. 
No one seems to think that mental hospitals are the answer. At best, they're a holding operation until we think of something better. You know, it's undeniably true that there are some people who, who get upset in ways that, that are labeled mental illness, and they do things or say things that other people look at as bizarre. I mean, that's true. But the whole question of how to deal with it, and to our point of view, dealing with it by putting people in mental hospitals just compounds the problem. You know, you just as well have euthanasia if you're going to shut people up in Napa, like happens to them. I mean, we, we all have read and, and, you know, maybe have seen people who've gotten lost in mental institutions. Just forever. So why don't we just take them and shoot them all down? Or why don't we be like the Nazis and shove them all in ovens and gas them? You know, if they're... They don't belong in society, get rid of them. Is that what you're saying? And what about psychiatry? Well, I've proposed that psychiatry be abolished. Um, I think buried. That, buried. Buried. I think that people who have real brain disease, as most of the patients in hospitals like this have, should be looked after by neurologists and by psychiatrists who are then retrained in neurology and who really look after and understand brain disease. I think the rest of psychiatry, the outpatient private practice psychiatry, should be redefined as education. That people who have problems of living should be able to go to people, call them tutors if you like, and that they should be paid as tutors. They shouldn't be paid as part of a medical insurance scheme. Uh, just like if you want to learn French, you contract with a tutor and uh, arrive at a price to learn French. If you want to learn about yourself, you should be able to contract with a tutor to go and learn about yourself. But we shouldn't be calling that medicine. We who have made this report do not know enough to endorse or to refute Dr. Torrey's stern proposal that psychiatry be abolished and its functions be distributed to strictly medical doctors and to counselors on the problems of everyday life. But we have seen enough to suggest it would become psychiatry to proceed with more modesty and much more self-discipline. It deals, after all, with something for which there is no clear definition, mental illness and therefore often there is no certain diagnosis. Too often the distinction between sanity and insanity is there and there, we're out here. For our part, we non-psychiatrists can do something. Banish from our minds the suspicions and restrictions society attaches to people with mental problems. Cultivate tolerance and compassion. For there but for the grace of God go we.